Hi, I'm Wayne Jones. Welcome to Writing and Editing. This is episode 144, One Thriller Writer's Technique, Less Dialogue by Characters, More Dialogue with Book Clubs. My guest is Matt Witten, who now writes thrillers for a living after spending 20 years writing for television, including shows such as Law and & Order and CSI. Hi, hey, Matt. Thanks for joining me on the uh, podcast. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Wayne. It's a pleasure. You've got the several novels. You've got a, a series of uh, mysteries that you that you published. Uh, I think there are four, five, six, maybe even more of them that you did. Uh, and but you've also been what you've got. What you've got now is a couple of thrillers from a place called Ocean View Publishing in Florida. And in fact, the second one was just published like fifteen hours ago or something. <laughs> so congratulations on that. And Thank by you. the way, since I, I get my books on Kindle, I was actually, I read some of it today. So uh, okay. that's good. But I wonder to start before we get into uh, the the mysteries, the thrillers and the whatever, uh, could you give the listeners an idea of not only your literary career, but you also had a substantial career in in, in TV and still do as a, as a writer as, as well. And could you give an idea, kind of a summation of that? Uh, yeah, sure. I actually started out as a playwright, and uh, I wrote uh, several plays that were produced around the world. And then when I hit a certain point in my 30s, I decided that what I liked most in the world was to, uh, in terms of recreation, uh, consuming uh, uh, entertainment, was to lie down on the sofa, have a cup of tea, and read a murder mystery. <laughs> so I decided that's what I love the most, even more than you know going to see a play or watching TV. So I decided I would try my hand at writing them. So I wrote four murder mysteries. It was a tremendous amount of fun. And then uh, I unexpectedly got the call from Law & Order to come to LA and write for Law & Order. It kind of came out of the blue. So I went to uh, Los Angeles. I had been living in a small town in upstate New York called Saratoga Springs. So we moved from small Saratoga Springs up to uh, large Los Angeles, uh, Hollywood, and uh, spent 10 years. I've spent the last 10 years writing for television. And then the same thing happened with me a couple uh, years ago where I thought, what do I like most in this world to consume you know, recreationally? And it's not so much to watch a TV show, really. It's really what I like best is reading thrillers. I just love you know, putting my feet up, cup of tea, reading a thriller. So I decided I'll try my hands at writing them. So I did. I wrote uh, this one called The Necklace. Let's see, I have it here somewhere. I wrote this one called The Necklace. It was uh, published last year. And uh, it's actually optioned for a movie by Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, things go slowly in Hollywood, so we'll see uh, when right. that happens. But Good luck. Um, uh, thank you. But in any case, it's done extremely well. It was later. Uh, it's also been published in uh, the Czech Republic. This is a picture of it. Uh, it's it's uh, <laughs> called Poprava, which means execution in the Czech Republic. And as if you're looking at this on the screen, you can see that the the cover looks very different. It was published in uh, Poland. This is the this is the cover wow. in Poland, and in Poland the title is not the necklace. The title is "I wish him dead." <laughs> so it's interesting how that's done. Yeah, yeah, fast. It is. It is. I guess in some countries they're just so amazed that we still execute people that they like calling it, you know, execution because uh, it's so striking. And "I wish him dead" is certainly direct in a way. Uh, anyway, that's being published in five other countries too. And then this one, as you said, I have a book coming out today, and this is a killer story. And this is a thriller uh, that is about a, uh, a, a uh, idealistic reporter who launches a true crime podcast to investigate the murder of an alt-right YouTuber she loved like a little sister, despite their political differences. And I think you asked me to speak about, you know, the other experiences besides just the, uh, the uh, novel writing. So I'll just sure. say briefly, and you can, you know, follow up as you like. Uh, in the years that I've spent, uh, you know, here in Hollywood, uh, I've written for Law and Order, House, Pretty Little Liars, about uh, six or seven other TV dramas. Uh, I just finished writing a pilot for NBC, and we'll find out uh, in February whether or not they will shoot it. Um, we've been paid very well to write it, so I'm happy about that. And now we'll find out if it actually makes the air. And I'm also writing uh, a, a mystery for Hallmark, a mystery movie for Hallmark. Uh, based on uh, a novel called A Dark and Stormy Murder by Julia Buckley. So 
just turned in the outline to the producer last week. And I'm very excited about that project. I'm excited about it. So, you know, so that's my TV career in a nutshell. I've written for a lot of dramas and written uh, uh, some other kinds of things too. But you're still doing uh, screenwriting as well, obviously, as well as the the thriller writing. It's interesting when you were talking about uh, you know the what I really like doing. You were talking about lying down on the couch reading a thriller. Uh, maybe this is cliche to ask, but uh, do you like what? Why wasn't it lying down on the couch watching thrillers movies? Do you enjoy thriller movies as thriller film as well? I do. I do. I yeah. enjoy thriller movies. I enjoy thriller TV shows and, and crime shows. So I do. I enjoy that also. I I, I I enjoy that also. But I guess, you know, my, my first preference is, you know, just to read. I, I'm not sure what it is about it. I think it's that I can go at my own speed. If there's something that seems a little slow to me, I can skim through it. Um, I think I like sort of being in control of the experience in some way. Um, I'm not sure exactly why I prefer that form. I I certainly think there's a depth of character that you can get in novels that sometimes is harder to get in TV shows and movies. Um, and uh, I don't have a really have a logical reason for it uh, or, or a belief that one is better than the other. Um, it's just, you know, my preference is to what I like. So um, that's what I do. Yeah, no, no, yeah, I, I totally agree with you as well. There's no such thing as one being those. They're just different media or different formats or whatever you want to call them. Uh, there's no superiority of one or the other. And I wanted to ask you something sort of related to that in a way, because uh, as I say, I did get a chance yesterday to read some of the necklace, and today I got a chance to read some of Killer Story. And what I found that you avoided, uh, which is something I've I've seen in some other. I, uh, some other uh, mysteries and thrillers that I've read is that they're super dialogue heavy and they, they sort of skimp a little on description. And I, I didn't, I didn't see that so much in killer story, for example, there's a fair bit of, um, and I'm not saying there, there needs to be a formula for these things or anything like that, but often, often, or sometimes at least with thrillers, uh, thriller books, they're just uh swaths of pages of dialogue but that's not the case with killer story and what i was interested in was was that something you were conscious of uh like putting in because for example if you read this I've, I've seen screenplays and those don't have a lot of description in them they're basically dialogue were you conscious of saying i've got to put detail in here that's description or was that something you knew you were writing a book and your head just shifted you're writing a book. How, how did that go? Well, uh, you know, when I started writing these two novels uh, uh, three years ago, um, it had been a long time since I'd written, written novels and I was so used to writing TV um, that when I started writing novels again and I brought them into my writing group, they actually said there was not enough description or they said there was not enough internal dialogue of the character. So, uh, I, because I had gotten used to writing teleplays, which, as you say, don't have that. So in my second draft, I, I put in a lot more description. And they told me I had, to, and internal monologue, and they told me I had too much. <laughs> so so then I, I found, you know, what I think is, is the happy medium. And so I never exactly thought about how much description, um, you know, I have or how much dialogue. But I did think I did think deeply about, you know, what worked and and what worked for people, what worked for the people in my writing group, which turns out to be roughly what works for you know people at large. Um, I will say, if I open up a you know a book of mine, and I will sometimes, and I'm like, huh, you know, there's no dialogue on this page. Wait a minute, I'm a guy that loves to read dialogue uh, in in the books that I read, like. Like if I have a, a thriller that has like two pages or three of dialogue, I might actually react kind of positively to it. So sometimes I will look at the book and say, wait a minute, there's no dialogue in that page. What the heck am I doing? Would I want to read that? And then I read it and I find that actually there's some reason for not dialogue. You yeah. know, that there's something really, you know, exciting, not to be corny about it, but there's something going on in my character's head. You know, that just the way she's thinking things through is just really gripping for me and hopefully for other people too. Um and uh, so I, I don't know, I, I, that's, that's sort of, you know, the way I go. I would say that 
it's interesting that I, it seems like I have a lot of description. I actually uh, sometimes feel that people say, oh, you don't set the scene enough. You don't really like lay out the scene enough, like place our characters enough. So that's something that I'm very conscious of uh, when I, you know, write my final draft is, you know, I look at all my scenes just to make sure that the reader is going to be able to really feel, you know, where they, where they are. Right. And hopefully then I'll get the response, you know, from people that they can say, you know, th that it was very visual, that they see everything and they feel like they're right there in the scene, you know, when they're reading it. So that is what I aspire to. That's interesting. Yeah. And of course, there's a matter of, on the one hand, style of the writer, but also uh, whatever capacity or whatever for the reader, because some readers don't like to read a lot of description. I, I frankly don't. I don't want to see six pages of description of whatever forest someone is going into. I, 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 I would probably skip through that. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of variables that are going on there, but uh, but I, I really noticed that. I was really expecting when I picked it up to see lots and lots of dialogue, but it's actually very, very balanced and uh, uh, readable, uh, very, yeah, very you. much so. So uh, thank you. That That's certainly what I aspire to. Um, and um, yeah, because I'm very cognizant that, uh, you know, as a playwright, nobody skims they just sit in their chair and they're stuck there and if it's a little, bit, a little boring stretch they can't flip the page and if it's a tv show you kind of can a little bit uh you can get on your phone and sort of pay, you know get on your phone until something interesting happens with a tv show but it's still harder to skim and i try to write my books as though they were stage plays like i don't want anybody you know skimming just for a second but it, you know what you're saying about people just have different tastes it's true i mean in my writing group um if somebody brings in a, a chapter and nobody's talking until, you know, the fourth paragraph, you know, I'm the one that says afterwards, you know, I kind of wonder, could we get to the dialogue quicker? You know, could we right. get it, do it by, by scene three? You know, I got enough of the description already. And then the other people are the ones that'll say, oh, you know, I love this because I could really just see where it was. I had such a feel for it. You know, it was beautiful. The words are beautiful. And the description is great. And I'm like, Okay, I guess there are. <laughs> I guess there are different viewpoints people have as to what they enjoy. I mean, you, I know that already, but you know, when you just see it play out in real life, it's like, okay, that's interesting. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. Different readers, different writers. The yeah. other thing, and I'm I'm curious about this. About I, I write myself as well, but I'm curious about this about all writers, and it's about. Uh, you did say something. It was I was looking at your website, and you you had a very nice description there of your your ritual that involved hummus toast and then coming home and and doing other writing at your stand-up desk which i thought wow that's that's pretty cool and uh but i've been trying i'm interested in your um logistics basically uh like just say for killer story uh are you a meticulous outliner and setting out characters and writing descriptions of them and going back and referring to that or do you did you start with an idea and just sort of uh, take off from there, so to speak? Well, in general, when I'm writing uh, mysteries, which uh, Killer Story is a mystery thriller, I know who gets killed and then I know who done it. And then some of the red herrings in the middle, I know uh, uh, some of the suspects I know. Some of them I, I might add one or two, so I don't quite know them. A lot of the twists I know, but a lot of the twists I don't know in the middle. So I know the beginning, in the end, I don't necessarily know the middle. As to knowing who the characters are, I'm not somebody that like writes like a couple pages about each character before I get started. Mm -hmm. But what I really like to do is I like to go on 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 walks with my wife uh, in the evening after dinner and gossip about the characters. So uh, you know, for the character of Petra in Killer Story, you know, what does she like to eat? You know, how tall is she? Um, you know, what does she weigh? Um, what is she, what kind of music does she love? Um, you know, what's her relationship, you know, with her mother, everything that might possibly play in, you know, who, who's her best friend at college? You know, I just want to know everything about her. So, you know, we'll gossip about her for a long time and it's a lot of fun. It's, it's like, you know, you might gossip about your neighbors, your friends, and that's like a fun after dinner conversation, but instead we'll just do it about these characters. And it really helps me to get a real feel for the character. And the other thing I'll do is that I'll, um, well, I'll take long walks or bi bicycle rides by myself and think about the character. So that's my process in terms of getting uh, deeply into who they are. Um, and I'm, 
No, please go ahead. Well, I was just going to tell you one funny story, or I find it funny about Pillar Story, which is that um, out of all the books and TV shows I've written that were mysteries, I always knew who done it. Like I said, I always know the end at the when I start. So with Pillar Story, I was about two thirds of the way into the book, and I was at an artist colony in Iceland called Gulkestan, and it was June, and it was three in the morning, and I was lying in bed um, just because my circadian rhythms were off because of light all the time. And I was thinking about the killer. And I said, the killer doesn't feel right to me. I don't know. It sounds, seem, he seems a little boring, a little bit not interesting. And I said, you know, it's kind of weird. We don't meet him early on. Because one of my main things about writing a mystery is you got to meet the killer earlier on, early on, or else it will seem like um, he came out of nowhere. Like when he finally turns out to commit the murder, it just won't be satisfying. So the killer wasn't appearing in my book until page 80. I was like, you know, man, that's too late. Well, he did kind of appear a tiny bit in chapter two, but just a tiny bit. I said, so he does appear early, but I was kidding myself. He wasn't appearing well. So finally, we're like around four or 5 a.m. I say, okay, well, maybe I'll put him in chapter four. You know, maybe I can put him in chapter four and that'll be good enough. So I tried to put him in chapter four, you know, in my mind as I'm thinking about how the chapter goes. And I couldn't figure out where to put him because no matter where I put him, it felt like he was breaking up the action. He was superfluous. He was just not an interesting character. Okay, so what am I going to do? So then I try to convince myself, you know, it's really okay that he doesn't appear until page 80 because my book is unique for whatever BS reason I came up with, why it would be okay. Finally, I say to myself, must have been like seven in the morning by now. Finally, I say to myself, dude, you've got the wrong killer. So I said, okay, who could the killer be? I said, well, he could be X. No, that wouldn't work. That's no good. Could be Y. No, that would no good. Y is not a good character to be a killer. Could be character Z. Nah, it would be cool if it could be character Z, but it really couldn't be for this reason, this reason, and this reason. Mm -hmm. But it would be cool if it could be character Z. But no, I can't. Finally, like around 9 a.m., I said, okay, it's character Z. You know, it's going to be character Z. And because uh, it's cool and that'll feel good. And we meet, we meet the character early. So I called up my wife from Iceland. I said, oh, a little change in the book. Uh, we got a new killer. <laughs> And uh, first time I ever did that. And, um, and uh, you know, really that part of Killer Story is my favorite. You know, the ending and the reveal of who the killer is and, and the fallout from that is really my favorite part. So uh, anyway, that's just, I just enjoy that story because it's different from what I usually do. And it, it just, it just amused me that I, that I did that. So that seems like a huge deal. And it's very different from what I've uh, heard from uh, other uh either mystery or thriller writers where they have spreadsheets and they've got the whole thing kind of mapped out. Again, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, yeah. but there's no way they, they would operate like that. They've got the killer all figured out and it's all going to happen in cell 52 of the spreadsheet kind of thing. You know, it's, I this mean, is when it's going to happen. So Absolutely. And like I said, I've always been that way, at least to the extent of who done it. So it was it was it was a real uh, it was a real surprise for me for sure, you know one one TV show that that I really liked the first seven episodes of was the, was uh, True Detective, uh, which came out about six or seven years ago, and really great first seven episodes. It was on HBO, starred Matthew McConaughey, so good. And then episode eight, the final episode of season one, came, and the killer turned out to be some dude. He was like a janitor or something that we'd seen barely in the back of the screen, like once in episode three. And I was so disappointed by that killer. I was so aggravated by that last episode. Like, I, you know, that I mean, I've never watched a true detective season since then because it, it ticked me off so much. So, you know, I, 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 you know, I, t I take this, this very seriously, the structural elements. I was working on one TV show, which um, I don't think I'll name, but I was working on one TV show, the pilot of it. Um, it, it aired on ABC and the two head writers were trying to figure out who the uh, who the killer would be. Would it be the, the guy or, or his wife, the husband or the wife? Now, I knew that the audience would never give a darn which of them it was because they had not been introduced into the show until it was either the end of act two or the beginning of act three uh, mm -hmm. around the middle, the midway point of the of the show way too late to introduce the killer just way too late and so i knew it wasn't going to work and i really like these head writers really very talented writers and very nice people i just tremendously like them and 
you know, I did my best to, you know, encourage, you know, seeing the killer in, in the teaser in the first few minutes of the show and doing what we could there. But, you know, there was, we were in a hurry to get the production moving and there wasn't time to organizing and it just didn't happen. And so the, the pilot never quite, you know, cohered in terms of the mystery. Like the personal stuff was good between the characters, but the actual plot of the mystery was was not satisfying. So anyway, it's something I've thought about, you know, ever since then. I, I know that's only one element of writing a good mystery, but um, anyway, that's just another story related to that. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I, I have to say, I'd never thought about that before because it, it would be a bit of, let's say if you have a 300 page book, and the killer doesn't get introduced till page 290. It, the, the first thing that came to my mind is sort of like the person who's running a marathon and they only join at mile 26, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. And, and that you know, it, it does, it's a bit of a cheat because uh, it's easy, any, it, it's easy for, well, not easy, but if you know what I mean, uh, the part of the great thing about a thriller or a mystery is that the person is always there throughout, but you're never, but maybe you don't figure out that that's the person. But if you put him on page 290, of course, no one has found out because he's only <laughs> been there for 10 pages. So. It's, it's totally unfair. Well, I'll give you a cheat code for the next uh, uh, crime show, murder show you see on TV. If you see a superfluous character in the teaser or act one, that's the killer. So for instance, if the two cops come to the house to interview Joe, let's say Joe is the... Um, is the, is the husband of the victim. And for some reason, there's some guy opening the door, you know, Fred, who's maybe, let's say, Joe's brother. And there's no reason for him to be there. They open the door and they say, oh, you want to see Joe? I'll call him Joe. And then Joe comes from downstairs and then Fred maybe listens for a while. Maybe he leaves. You know Fred is the killer because, <laughs> because it's, the, uh, it's, the, it's the TV writer just knowing I got to have that guy, you know, in the show early. So... You know, usually if you write it, you know, a TV show like that, you you try to do it more artfully. So so he's th the character is not superfluous. But anytime you do see a superfluous character, ninety nine to one, that's the killer. Yeah, and that's you mentioned a good term there: artfulness and nuance and artistry and sort sort of things like that. It's not just about sort of covering it up, so to speak. But um, those things are important. That's the basically what separates good writing from bad. I, I wanted to take a little bit of a turn and you just you just briefly referred to it, but I was really interested in that thing you mentioned, the Gulkistan residency in Iceland. Right. Was that a, was that a situation where, uh, if you don't mind saying, where you simply had a residency and you were writing and you spent a lot of time in solitude or were you also there as you have sort of writers and residents at public libraries where uh, people in the community also come and they have manuscripts that you evaluate or were you simply there to do your own writing? I was simply there to do my own writing and it was uh, terrific. I've been to several writers colonies in, in my life. This was my first one in about uh, probably 25 years because when my kids were born, uh, I could no longer uh, go away somewhere for a month to go to an artist colony or a writer's colony. But, um, you know, it's just a place you go and it's just quiet and um, you just write. And depending on the particular colony, there might be uh, a few other writers there or perhaps some visual artists there. And uh, so you have a little bit of socializing, you know, at dinner, sometimes you share dinners. It depends on the situation, but sometimes you'll share dinners that maybe you'll make for people one night and somebody else will make another night. Or sometimes the place itself will make dinners. Like when I've stayed at Yado, the writer's colony in uh, Saratoga, uh, artist colony, um, they provide the dinners. Um, but it's just, it's just a place to go in solitude away from your laundry, away from, you know, the demands of your usual social life. Uh, you have to, you know, keep it low on the, uh, on the internet, but, um, away from the demands of your in-person social life. And, um, it's very, it's very peaceful. I think that being in Gulkistan in Iceland for a month, uh, was responsible for my, you know, really being able to write killer story is a good book. Because for me to be, you know, lying on, you know, lying in bed there from, you know, all night and just have all the time in the world to think about it, you know, enabled me to really take a step back from the book and think about what's really cool. And I think it's possible that if I had not done that, I would have stuck with my original murderer 
and I would uh, have a much worse book. And, you know, that's advice that I always, you know, give writers is to, you know, really take some time to step back, you know, reasonably often in the writing process and take a walk, take a bike ride, take a swim, uh, lie in bed, whatever is useful. And just think, what is really cool about my book? You know, what do I love about my book? What am I trying to say in my book? What's what's my theme? Mm-hmm. Um, also, what's unique? What do I bring to it? Um, what do I care about? So, um, so anyway, I, I whatever whatever means you have, whether it's going to Iceland or 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 just you know uh, taking a long weekend where you don't really see people, um, I think is a good idea. Yeah, definitely. Rather than just sort of powering through like it were a, a project at work or something like that, right? I need right. To, I, I mean, need... there's certainly a time for powering through. I mean, I I appreciate that too because sometimes if I if I power through, then I don't lose momentum and I forget who my characters. I do, I don't forget what they're doing. You know, it's it's because when you go away from a from a project and then you come back a week later, it's so hard to get going again. So there is. So I guess it's like a combination of powering through, but then finding the times to take a break. Like I might power through for 170 pages of the book, and then something tells me that I just need to take a stop, to stop and take stock of what's going on and see what I think. So I don't mean to contradict myself by saying powering through is good, but I think there's I think there's value in that also. Yeah. The last thing I want to ask you about uh, is um, I was also interested. I thought that you have a very good website with very full information about, it, you know, all sorts of things and many activities, including blogging that you're involved in. But I was also curious about the the your your uh, reach outs to uh, to book clubs, and uh, uh, where you. Uh, I think you'll even meet with certain book clubs. This is for listeners who don't know. Uh, there's probably lots who do know about, you know, uh, often, you know, there might be a half dozen people who meet, they read the same book, they come together and there's questions. And even some publishers will publish in the back of the, of a novel now, a list of questions for discussion by book clubs. I once had a gig like that, by the way, when I was writing for Penguin about 20 years ago, where for $200 a book, they pay me to come up with 10 questions uh, for book clubs. That was, that, was, that was a long time ago. But that it was, sounds like a fun gig. It was a good a good gig for a while, yeah. And but So I'm interested in how those have gone. Have you had cases where would you personally show up at the book club or is it by zoom or how, how does it all work? I think it's all been by zoom. I think I've done it about five or six times and um, it's fun. Uh, usually they have me, you know, at the beginning of the, of the book club. And then, you know, we talk and they ask questions and so on for um, I'm going to say half an hour, 45 minutes, something like that. And then, you know, then I go and they continue on with the book club because book clubs obviously have other functions too. They're social, social gatherings. So anyway, so I go with that, or then sometimes um, they uh, they talk about the book uh, uh, for a while and then bring me in for you know twenty minutes or whatever when they have questions about it, and yes. um, and I enjoy it. You know, any opportunity you have to you know like meet your readers and get their perspectives on the book, you learn interesting things about the book, and you just, it's it's just fascinating. You kind of learn things that you might use actually in your future writing. I've learned some things about the books that I thought. Oh, okay. That's something I can I can bring to my next book. That that knowledge that I now have. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I've I've enjoyed it. It's 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 such a joy. I mean, it's um it's it's just great. You know, it's great to you know to have people appreciate your work and be interested and you know want to spend a couple of hours or whatever talking about it is you know it's an honor. Um, yeah, and I imagine for the for the book club, it's awesome, right? To have a, just to have the author there to. Either not that you know you're the uh, expert on the book and you you'll spend all time contradicting what they're saying or whatever, but it's just such a, a awesome sort of a connection I, for for the club. It must be just excellent. So I think they've really enjoyed it. And there was one club um, uh, about uh, eight or nine women from Tennessee, and and I think I was you know I was the first time they'd done it I don't remember why they thought to contact me maybe they were a pretty young book club uh, uh, you know first couple of meetings and I told them you know I said let me tell you any writer <laughs> is going to want to be in your book club uh, you know maybe not somebody you know famous but but like me I'm not you know Stephen King 
but any other writer is really going to enjoy it and, and do it. I said, if you reach out to anybody through their website, they're just going to say yes. So yeah, I would say anybody out there who's, who's, uh, you know, who's in a book club, you know, ask me to come, but also ask uh, any writer that you just enjoy their work and you'll be surprised. They'll be really appreciative of the chance to, you know, just share their work, you know, in person with people, you know, writers can be kind of um, introverted, but we also can be uh, really enjoy performing. I know that sounds like a contradiction, uh, but uh, I've, I've known that to be true many times. We just, we enjoy kind of getting up on stage and like, you know, like I am now, I'm, I feel pretty at ease. I might be in, introverted in other circumstances, but you know, we enjoy performing and we enjoy like, we enjoy being at book clubs. Right. And the whole, of course, the whole thing about writing a book is uh, putting the results of a performance out there. You know, a, a writer is interested in expression. So, uh, and that could come in many forms. Matt, uh, this has been really excellent. Uh, I learned, uh, uh, some things I didn't know about you and about the process. That whole thing about the um, the 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 killer having to be early. I I never really thought about that before, but it's a good point. Uh, congrats on your sixteen hour old book. I hope it sells well, and uh, thanks for doing this. Thank you, Wayne. I really enjoyed it. Enjoyed talking with you. And that's all for this episode. Thanks for listening. Check out the show's website at writingediting.ca to find links to subscribe or contact me and how to rate or review the podcast. I'll be back on Saturday for another short feature in the series, One More Word. Please join me.